appreciate this opportunity to be here today and also um, to be here to learn more about the research and department. As Gila just mentioned, I'm going to stay here for the next six months. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not going to here. And, oh, thank you. Yeah, just one correction. Uh, I'm actually a first year DPL student. I'm working, uh, first year DPL student in the University of Oxford. I'm working with Professor Jack Nichols on Malay Beijing inference. And I thought until now, my research has mainly been focusing on Beijing inference in the part of the framework. So this is what I'm going to share today as well. Then I'm going to talk about some of my research and also some further extension I'm going to work on for the model. Right. So the motivation of this project actually comes from a rectal data, the general rectal data collected by Dr. Ka Dr. Um, Nicholas Carr and Dr. Um, and Dr. David Johnson. The data consists of around 3,000 witnesses to historical legal documents from the 12th century of England. So basically, when the, in that time, when a significant historical legal event happens, there should be some witnesses signing the document to make sure to make sure the legitimacy of the document. And so, um, so here's the example witness list in the, from 1127 to 1129. As we can see, generally the witnesses signed the orders based on, their, based on the ranking of importance. Like in this, in this list, the archbishop will generally sign before the bishops and the bishop will generally sign before the earls. When, pre yeah, when presented with this data, they're really interested to study the power relation between the bishops, like which, which bishop is more important from the others. All right, so they get the more, the more important, you know, given your class of bishop, mm -hmm. where you appear on that list depends on how important, so we can learn something from history about yeah, exactly. ranking. Yeah, exactly. Go. That's why we're trying to propose a ranking model and be some partial audits. Yeah. And uh, so by looking at by looking at this list, we can um, if you are seeing the more important bishop we always sign the first, mm -hmm. then we conclude the bishop of, of Salisbury is always on, is more important than Bishop of Winchester. Mm -hmm. But by inspecting the document, we figure out like there might be other exceptions of this assumption. For example, if these two bishops are incomparable, or like if they're equal in their so in their importance, if they're of equal different importance. Then they can sign either order. It doesn't matter for them. For example, in another in another legal document, the Bishop of Manchester might also may, might actually sign before the Bishop of Salisbury. Salisbury. That's where we can uh, we think about the concept of partial order, which allows us to rank the bishop bishops who are incomparable, and it's a more free, a flexible framework of ranking. Um, so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to replace all the names of bishop with the numbers for better illustration. A partial order is, um, is a partial relation that assigns the binary relation to, to, um, to a list of, to a, to a set of actors. So, um, to set, so the binary relation should be both irreflexive, which means um, actor one cannot fit himself. So we can't have a relation here drawing from actor one back to actor one. And the re binary relation should also be asymmetric, which means if one be two, then two can fit one. We can have either one be two or two be one, but we can't have both. And the last one, the last requirement for the binary relation is transitivity. So if one be two and two be five, then one also be five. We generally represent a partial order using a directed um, acyclic graph. Mm. And um, uh, I love take, doing this representation. We generally eliminate the edge that is created by transitivity. For example, if one fits five, but transitivity is through two, then we eliminate this edge just for better visualization. Because our data spans such a long time period, it's in the 12th century, we break this data down into several different time windows. And here are two examples of the witness list in two different time periods. Uh, as we can see in the first example, we have seven, uh, we have seven witness lists observed from, from 1119 to 1121. Um, and to the right hand side is a summary partial order of this, of this ranking uh, of all these lists. This part order is also called the intersection order. 
um, which, which is a way of representing the order ranking list. In the intersection order, we only conclude there's an order relation between the actors if one actor always occurred before the other actor. So for example, we will conclude that actor one beat actor two if actor one always appears in front of actor, actor two in all the lists. And so can I just get to, yeah, to the columns mm -hmm. and the distinction? So what, what does each one of the, so each column, so those lists, those one, is how they were ranked in the in the document. Oh, each row is each list. Oh, right. Each row is each list, and yeah. then these are the and the, the yes, and the, so different rows correspond to different lists. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And we have so the list. thing in the bracket is the year. Oh, is the year? So this yeah. One's up so I was wondering about it. Too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this one says yeah, all right. We have okay. clarified it. Uh, five, yeah. six. So number five, whoever that was, was ahead of whoever the number six was, who was in, and, and so on and so forth. And that's why one is always at the top because you, you look at those rows, you, mm -hmm. you typically have one to begin with, although sometimes there's 10. There's 10. Okay. Oh, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. No, I just saw it up there. So I'm just sorry. Yep. Yeah, just oh. trying to figure out yeah, how you got that diagram from those numbers, but I, I see now. Thank you. Yeah, it's a patch. Oh, there's like a summary of yeah. all this. Yes. Okay. One, sorry, is, uh, but 10 is always before. is. Oh no, it's not always after yeah, one. I see, it just changes. It's after one sometimes. Yeah, that's yeah, why yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was actually about to mention it because, because we can observe um, 10, 1, and also 1, 10. That's why we're concluding so that they're the same. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah they're like incomparable. Mm. Um, so, so in your model, do you use the raw data or just use the, uh, the, the figure like the? Uh, so this would be our observation in my yeah. model. So, so um, and this is the underlying partial order. So in basically in our model, we uh, assume the witness list actually generates from the partial, uh, generated from the partial order. Yeah. And yeah, and also similarly, we also construct the uh, assembly partial intersection order for the second witness list. Okay. And here we come, we conclude actor two, four, six are incomparable. Because from the witness list, we can say two bit four, two, uh, two bit six, two to occur in front of six, mm -hmm. and also we can say six to occur in front of four, and also four occur in front of two. Because in the partial order a framework, we wouldn't allow such a loop to exist. That's why we conclude they're incomparable. So when they're incomparable, so you say all those things on the same row are incomparable? Yeah, if there's no um, if there's no order relation between the actors, then they're all the same. Uh, no, it's more like say incomparable. We can't actually conclude that whether they're the same or not. It's just we're saying that there's no order relation between them. Right. Yeah. Um, same in the sense that we don't know which one is better. Yeah, which one is more important. Yeah. So like. Um, by the, by which order they take actually doesn't matter in this case. And this is why we're using part order framework because we think total order wouldn't really capture the power relation. So the fact that they're the same horizontal position means that they're, they're not comparable. You, yeah, know, you can't they're, rank them. Yeah, yeah. They're not comparable. And like yeah. if we actually observe them in one, in one list, in one ranks list, mm -hmm. they might occur in either order. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and once, okay. so just sorry, you, so you, you assume the data is generated from the partial order, you know, yeah. and do you assume that there's noise in the way that the data is generated from the partial order? Yeah, that's actually something I'm going to talk about. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah, um, so actually when, uh, when playing with the data, we observe like, if there's any error in the, record, in the recording error in the data, for example, if we switch the order between four and two here, the structure of the partial order changes significantly. Yeah, so this is the previous partial order before. Yeah, and what, what, which ones have we just changed? I changed the order between active one, active two. Right. And this is the new partial order after switching these two orders. Right. Wow. So it's the order between these two. And it's actually, and it's also possible to happen just um, 
by thinking about our setting, the bishop and the wait list when the bishop has signed the witness list. Mm -hmm. For example, if actor four is more important than actor two, but if they arrive later for the to sign the document, then it's possible for his signature to to be below the actor two signature. Mm -hmm. That's why we think it's um it's natural and realistic for us to consider errors and recording errors in the data. And that's why we are thinking about using the observation model that captures the arrow in the ranking lists. And one thing before uh, we go ahead, one thing to note is that the intersection all is just one way to represent all this ranking list. There might be other partial orders that are possible, there might be other possible partial orders. For example, as we observe in the first example, actors three and five never occur in the same list. So, if they, so even if we add an edge here between actor three and actor five, it's still a valid partial order to represent this data. So that's why we're thinking about using the using Bayesian inference to try to find the most prob probable partial order as the true uh, online relation. Oh, Oh, just before you move on from the slide, what are yeah. the dashes for? Oh, the dashes here? Yeah. Oh, this is because, oh, this is just for better illustration, because before we're talking about, uh, we have 2 beat 6, 6 beat 4, and 2 beat oh, 4 okay. beat 2. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's uh, it's just, just like, yeah, to highlight okay. that they're incomparable. So, uh, so basically in our model, we assume the true underlying relation, the power relation between the bishops can be represented by a partial order. And all this um, observed data are coming, are generated from the partial order with some possible recording errors. So to achieve this goal, first they need to find a prior, prior distribution for the partial orders. And then by observation model um, of, of our data given partial order. So I'm going to structure my talk um, based on this, this um, table of contents. First, I'm going to talk about the partial, some formal definition around partial orders. And then I'm going to introduce the prior and observation models, which leads to our, our partial order packet loose model. And then I'm going to present some inference results to show the model effectiveness. Finally, um, I'm going to talk about some further extensions. As we've talked about before, the partial order is an order relation that assigns binary relation over a set of actors. The, order, the binary relation is used to reflexive, asymmetric, and also transit, transitive. Uh, a partial order can be uniquely represented, uh, represented by transitively closed directed uh, acyclic graphs. Um, for example, in this toy example, we have we have um, two. We have all the relations between one, two, five, and one, three, four, five. But actor two is incomparable with actor three, and also incomparable with actor four. Another important concept around partial order is the linear extension. A linear extension is a permutation of all the actors that does not violate, violate the partial order. So, for example, um, here two is incomparable with three or four. So, we want the extension. Actor two can be of either these three different positions, and in this case, this partial order has three has three extensions: one, two, three, four, five; one, three, two, four, five; and one, three, four, two, five. Um, given this setup, a natural uh, a natural observation model of the list. So, if we assume there's no error in the data, then all the observed list would be one extension of the partial order. So a natural way, a natural observation model would be a uniform observation model along, among all the extensions. So for example, if we observe one list, we could assume it comes uniformly from the pool of the extensions this partial order have. Just a question. So you're saying yes. that number two could be on top of number four there, like it's a yeah because, so. yeah, because four or two is, is incomparable with actor four and it's also incomparable with actor three. So like you could swap two and three. Yeah, that's exactly what those if you look at those graphs going down, that's what she's done. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
which just sort of got, as you can see, the, the thing moved from one column along. And that's what the linear extensions are. Oh, this are all the three extensions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, they're, and they're, you know, ways in which they could have been extended if you were to do them linearly. It's the ways that they can stack so up. These, yeah. these are the next. Yeah, they're the linear extensions over here. Yeah. And you can't, yeah, sort of, yeah, that's right. I'm just looking. So the four would have to always, yeah, four should uh, always be after three, three, and three. yeah, it yeah. must be. Yeah, so uh, it should even be after two, right? So yes, so, so all yeah. the yeah. Um, compatible full regulars. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I understand. Uh, and another definition around partial order is the um, is a concept of gaps. A depth of partial order is defined to the length of the longest path of a partial order. For example, in this in this case, the longest path of this partial order is one, three, four, five, one, three, four, five. It is of length four, so this partial order is of depth four. This is an important concept for us because we want to apply from apply this a model of partial order to be able to have uniform depth distribution for all the sample partial orders. Basically, we don't want to impose any prior information onto the sampled paths, the sampled partial orders from, uh, from the prior distribution. Um, and another thing. So you're going to put priors on all the ways that you can actually draw that those graphs. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm thinking about put, uh, putting prior on all these partial orders. Yeah, all the ma many combinations that actually. All partial orders. So that's is that that's an example of a partial order, but there yeah. could be many others, right? Yeah, exactly. And and how many? So it must be a large space. There must be lots of partial orders you can draw yeah. from, say, five actors. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So basically, firstly, we are going to seek to, seek to find a prior a proper prior distribution for the partial orders. Right. Like one example would be a uniform distribution. Yeah, over all possible ones. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and also, when defining such a prior distribution, we want the, uh, we'd like to have the sample partial order to of uniform depths. So, for example, this partial order is of depths of of, uh, of four, yeah. but like if we have a total order, which means there's no two, yeah. yeah, like there's no partial relation, then it's of depths yeah. five. Yeah. yeah, we want to generate partial orders from the prior distribution to of uniform depths distribution. Right. Okay. So we have equal probability to have Partial order from different depths. Do you put a prior over the depths as well? Mm, no, it's no. just like we just constructed a prior right, distribution okay. that gives us yeah. such property. Um, and the final concept is about the intersection order of the partial order as we talk about the intersection order, which is a partial order constructed using k different permutations, as we talked about before. So in the intersection order, we only see there's an order relation if one actor always occur in front of the other. Like in this case, actor one always occur before actor two. So we see this actor one be actor two. But like we can see either we can see two be three or three be two. So we conclude that these two actors are incomparable. Right, so now um so, now, so there are several partial order models proposed over time, and now we seek to choose the most proper partial order model for our prior model for our model, for, for our setting. So the first one, and the most intuitive one, is a uniform distribution over all partial orders, as we just talked about before. Uh, for example, if there are two actors, then there will be three partial orders of generated through two actors, like an empty partial order, then the two actors have no relation, or like 1v2 or 2v1. Um, but there are several, there are two drawbacks with these models. First, as we talked about before, the depth distribution for this uniform distribution for this model is not uniform. Um, this is actually this actually comes from a result drawn by Clayton and uh, and your child. Um, so based on their based on their proof, when the number of actors goes to infinity, the depth of the partial order converges to in probability to three. So when we have like infinity actors, the, the majority partial order formed by all these actors is actually uh, is mo uh, mostly of depth three. Yeah, that's, that's a very, that's like really fascinating. Deep result. Yeah. 
even though it's only three. It, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a different um, idea why this happened. Yeah, like, why three? Yeah, why? so the most common, yeah. it's not. Why is the most common always three? I find this reason really fascinating, but I haven't understand that proof yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, is, like, it is like interesting, yeah. yeah but that definitely provides us some um, theoretical, theoretical base that this uniform distribution doesn't provide a uniform depth distribution. Mm. No. Yeah, and another thing is about margin is that this model doesn't have marginal consistency. So marginal consistency is a desired problem, the desirable problem case is when we take the marginals of the distribution also both the same family. For example, in the uniform case, if we take marginals of this distribution, for example, um, uh, so the, we would like the distribution still to be uniform. But as we talk about when there are two actors, we have three different partial orders. But um, when we move to three actors, there are actually 19 partial orders. It's, in, uh, it's impossible to, dis, to characterize these three, this 19 partial orders into three different catalogs. So, um, so it is easy to see that like marginal consistency doesn't hold in this model, in this uniform model. And there's another pro model proposed by Winkler that touches on both of these issues. In Winkler's model, he represents a partial order using a latent variable, the Z matrix, mm. which, he, uh, which is of n rows with each row representing one actor, and k column with each column representing one feature of the one feature of the actor. And in his model, he assumes that elements, all the elements of Z matrix follows a normal distribution. One interpretation of this model it's is normal or a uniform? Uh, uniform distribution. Yeah. 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 Um, one interpretation of this model is that we can draw the paths for each actor. So in this Zen matrix, each show represents each actor. And if we draw all the features for, for different actors, then if we draw the paths, um, then we could define the, the partial order based on this di diagram. Based on this diagram, we, we would only conclude this power this power relate all the relation if the parts of one actor always ap appear above the other actor. So, for example, we can conclude that actor one beats actor five. So it's not really clear here. Uh, beats actor five because the parts of actor one always always occur be, um, in above actor five. Uh, if there's any crossing on the paths, then we conclude the actors are incomparable. For example, we can see the paths of actor one and actor three cross here. So the, we conclude these two are incomparable. Uh, this model actually successfully tackled the problem of marginal consistency because at, from the little matrix, if we take out one row, then it won't change the power relation between other actors. So uh, the power relation is still preserved, so we have marginal consistency in this model. Um, but it still suffers from the problem of low depths, because um, as we can see, the depths of the generated partial order actually hugely depend on the, the value of k. The smaller the k is, the higher depth the partial order will be. If we take a really extreme example, if k, if k is equal to 1, then the generated partial order will, will be a total order which is of the high steps. So the, the lower the value of k, the higher depth the partial order will be. Um, but the issue is if we push down the value of k, the variety of partial order we could represent will be really limited. As a prior model, we would like to explore more, um, more possibility of partial orders. We don't really have too much restriction, which means we need to have a larger value of k which again pushes down the depth of partial orders. Um, so this this one job of this model. Um, to, to deal with the problem of low depths, there's one um, on real world, he proposed another model by introducing a depth parameter row. So in his, no, his model, he's still using a latent, latent variable setting. But instead of assuming uniform distribution on the, the uniform distribution on the on each row of the Z matrix, it assumes, assumes a multivariate normal distribution. 
this correlation row. So the larger that the larger row is, the, the flat the paths will be. So there'll be lower chance for us to say some crossing between the paths. Therefore, uh, therefore, if we have a larger value of real, we will have a higher depth in the partial order, higher, higher depth in the partial order. We don't change the dim dimension of the Z matrix. Uh, this is something we desire, and also uh, to and also based on our ex experiments, we see when the we can we see when the value of real goes to one, the the, the depth distribution of the derivative partial order actually is approximate uniform. So we choose this model as our prior, the prior distribution for the partial orders. And after choosing the prior model for the partial order, we also like to choose our observation model for the random orders of the observation model for the witness list. As we discussed before, if there's no error occurring in the witness list, then a uniform distribution would be a quite natural, a quite natural observation model to choose. This can also be shown by take, by finding the equilibrium equilibrium distribution of a stochastic process. Um, I will go, won't go too much into it into it in this talk. But to account account for errors, we actually lean towards the Plaquette loose model, um, which is a uh, which assigns the probability for different rankings to some actor attributes. This process can be more seen as a process of drawing balls from an arm. This drawing balls from the arm without replacement. And each time the probability of drawing a ball is actually weighted by the actor attributes. So based on this setup, the um, a ranking will be assigned the highest probability if it coincides with the, with the ranking with the order of its actor attributes. So if the final, final ranking of Y is the same as the ranking of alpha of, of the actor attributes, then this model will assign this ranking the highest probability. And this is something we would, we would prefer as well because we would like the highest probability on the right ranking, but also we will allow some possibility for other for the errors to occur. And so in our setup, we assume the actor attributes to the rank of actor attributes to follow the partial order. So basically in our setup, we assume our list to come to generate it from a true on the line true partial order. And, and that true partial order is governed by the attributes, and then those Ys are a realization from Yeah, exactly. Thank you. It's okay. And in this case, we, as, we assign a prior distribution on the alpha. We assign a prior distribution on the alpha as a multivariate normal distribution, as a truncated multivariate normal distribution. We, we stri restrict the, the ranking of alpha to follow the partial order. As the rank of alpha is a winding extension of the partial order. And we choose, a, there are several different options as a prior distribution for alpha as well. Here we choose the multivariate normal distribution because it is exchangeable. And if we do some math, we can see the ranking of up actually follows a uniform distribution of all the possible new extensions, which coincides with the case when there's no error in data. And after putting all these pieces together, we we finally construct the other partial order plaque loose model for Bayesian inference. Um, here is the prior model for the partial order, and here is the observation model with parameter with parameter alpha and sigma. One uh, one nice property of, of this model is that the parameter sigma actually indicates the model selection for us, because as we see from before. The sigma is the variance of alpha. So the higher sigma is, the more spread out alpha will be, and the less probability for, for error to occur. Less probability. Less, less probability for error to occur. So if alpha is more spread out, then the y generated would also, also follow the same rank, mm -hmm. ranking as alpha. So the performing Bayesian inference, if we observe really, observe really large. Can you just put row? I, 
I mean, was up to all your symbols and then now I'm sort of lost with what Rho is. Yeah, uh, Rho is the, so um, in the center of all the pipes. Or is it a P? It's a row. It's a row. Yeah. Yeah. So this is in the setup for the prior distribution of partial order. And that's and the z's are the late latents. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is the so they may depend upon these rows. Yeah. Yeah. Row is like the correlation. Okay. Okay. I get you. So you've got a p. So you've decomposed the prior. Um, so a priori, rho and alpha are independent, but that z depends on rho, but not alpha. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so you've got that, okay, the, the prior independent. And then you've got pi of sigma. sigma. So sigma, sigma is uh, on its own. And then there's a likelihood at the end, yeah. Yeah, sigma is the variance of alpha. Yeah. And okay. alpha actually depends on Okay, good, yeah, yeah, yeah. So alpha need to, need to respect the order. The and, order. and H is that mapping function from the previous slide. H of Z oh, is... Uh, is acting as a part of order represented yeah. by the Z matrix. Is that given on the previous? Was that the H is on the previous? Was there an H on the previous slide? Uh, or not? So, uh, no. so it's actually come from here. Okay. Yeah, H is the part of order represented by the Z matrix. Yeah, okay. Because um, beside this setup, um, there are actually the values in Z are all real, real numbers. Mm -hmm. So there are several different Z matrix representing one part of order. Mm -hmm. But one time actually can uniquely represent one partial order. So for one partial order, there are several dimensions that can represent it. Uh, right, so there's not a, so given a partial order, there's many probable late, you know, configurations of the latent. Yes. So it's an inversion problem, sort of, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, do you need, like, constraint the alpha to be consistent with uh, partial order? Uh, yes, this is so actually come from the prior distribution of alpha. The rank of alpha needs to be need to follow needs to respect the partial order. Uh, I'm thinking is is this uh, necessary? Um, like why? I know it, if they are consistent, it's good, right? It should be consistent, but because this is just the prior, yeah, you need to like. Make them consistent of each other. I don't know. Mm. Honestly, don't know. Because from my understanding, um, so this part of the prior is like pi of h, and this part of this is have an observation model is the probability of y given h. So alpha is a part where we fit the information in the part the information of partial order to have a final observed model. So we need to restrict its order to, to follow uh, its ranking to follow the partial order. Otherwise, these two models are um, you, it, I think if uh, if you don't um, put this constraint, mm -hmm. the alpha will be like ultimately it will be consistent with the partial order. Yes. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, uh, but. Because yeah, you have to the draw the samplings yeah. of yeah, the alpha, right? Yeah. Draw samplings of alpha and also the partial order. Um, so imagine if you just fix the, the partial order and the alpha will be consistent with the partial order. Um, yeah, so. Oh, yeah, if I have a separate chain for the alpha. Yeah. Do you, do you draw? Uh, samples of alpha. Before. Yeah, draw samples of alpha as well. Yeah, I think it will be consistent. Oh, you mean like if it doesn't follow the partial order, then it will assign like lower yeah. probability and right. yes. it will be rejected. Yeah. Yes. If that's true, the reason why we're coding the indicator function here is because we want the, uh, the, the distribution of the rank of alpha to be a uniform distribution. So um, uh, if we calculate based on this prior distribution, if we calculate the probability, the, um, the distribution of the rank of alphas, mm -hmm. it's actually a uniform distribution over all the linear stages, which coincides, which coincides with the case when there's no error recording error, which is the same as, as this observation distribution, mm -hmm. uh, observation model. 
or I'm, I'm uh, with last. Yeah. So can you say if alpha is zero and alpha is infinite, what does it mean? What does it mean? Okay. That, that normal, you know, alpha was coming from a normal distribution. So yeah. we're just truncated. So imagine it's not truncated. Mm -hmm. And then what does, what's the interpretation of it? What is alpha, if alpha is zero or yeah. alpha is infinite, what does it mean? Oh, uh, actually in this case, we don't, so our alpha here is actually a vector. So it takes, it has n entries and the ranking of alpha should respect the partial order. Then um, in this case, we're more, uh, we're more interested in the ranking of alpha because based on the packet loose, the final output of our, district, our model would be a rank, the ranking of the actors. Yes. Yeah, and alpha here are more like the weighted probability for us to draw for for us to draw actor. Okay. I don't think she's really interested in sort of alpha being zero or infinity. It's just that alpha comes from some normal distribution, and that they must be drawn in such ways that respects the partial yeah, order, the, right? And the then the y's are then a realization, you know, from the from yeah. the partial order because they are conditional on the alphas, which respect the partial order. Yeah. So yeah. we're more interested in the ranking of alpha. The value of alpha actually doesn't. Uh, doesn't matter too much in this model. So, so Jesse, what happens to if you don't have all the y's? So uh, in the example before, you had partial y's, I guess. Or missing, I suppose you just deal with missing um, observations like you do in, in anything. Yeah, that's, um, that's, yeah, that's actually one extension we're working on. Um, so in that case, we're actually using the concept of suborder. Um, if we go back to the third size. So, so, um, so this actually, model it actually naturally extends to once we have suborders. And then, uh, the suborder is also a partial order that is constructed by a subset of the actors, which doesn't vary with this current partial order. For example, this part, this part is a suborder of this total partial order. Mm -hmm. So in our model, just, just the garbage bin. Oh, okay. Just the rubbish bin. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Thank you. And when constructing our model, we're just uh, so here we just replace this full partial order with a sub order, and everything still works works the same works the same way. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, I didn't think about it. So, <laughs> I mean. uh, so, so basically for suborder, we, we might have like a sub, like it's just a sub, so the alpha vector be of a, like, like a lower, a smaller less. It might be of like less than j, which is less than or equal to a. And uh, this h would be a suborder instead of, instead of total order. So only considers actors that occur in this in this list for our inference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, and here, yeah, as, as we talked about before, the uh, parameter sigma actually offers as a pro as a prior for model selection. If sigma is of large value, then as it would say there are less errors in the data, so the packet loose component is not that important. But if sigma is of a really low, low value, like five or three, then indicates there are a lot of errors in the data, and also like indicates the importance of the packet loose component. And here are some inference results. Um, I actually generated, I recently generated a partial order. Uh, so this is a synthetic data experiment I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I generated a random partial order with five actors and then generated eight in extensions from this partial order. After this, I actually manually put some arrows into the linear extensions. And this is the intersection order by uh, my, uh, generated from the data I constructed. And after running the chain for, for a long time, um, the partial order finally converges to the right to the right part, to the right, to, uh, to the real, like to the true partial order. And these two are, are like the consensus partial order 
in the posterior distribution of the part, which is like the most probable part of part of the posterior distribution. And here are the trace plot of different parameters. Uh, as we can see, the, the posterior distribution for sigma actually centers Oh, yeah, um, like you said there were two partial orders were the most probable, but they look like the same thing. Oh, so these are two chairs. So I ran oh, two, two different two okay. chairs, yeah. and oh, these right. are two consistent partial order for these two different experiments, cool. and they all arrive at the same value as, you know, as the real partial order. And we can, so in this case, the true value of sigma is five, and we can say, um, the posterior distribution is exactly stated as the true part, as the true sigma value. Uh, so I'm still working on the inference result for the Bishop data. I hope I can present. So I don't have the result today. I hope I can present later. I think it's a very cool example too, and not one that you would normally think data science would have an awful lot to say about how powerful bishops were. Yeah, I was really surprised when I was yeah. to use the data as well. It was great. Is it publicly available? The yeah. data? Yeah. Oh, I have to oh, ask. Because they're not going to yeah, it. Because it's collected by historians. So what time is it? Right. Uh, so there are still some, uh, there are some further extension of this model as well. The first thing to, to uh, the first thing is something uh, Gila just mentioned, is the suborders. As we can see from the Bishop data, there are different lengths in the observed list. So, by considering sub order, we could um, ask our model to flexibly adopt to different lengths of the observed witness list. And the second thing is to consider covariates, because the ranking of bishop is not only defined, is not only decided by, uh, can also decide by other factors, for example, their age and also their wealth. So, in, in the future research, we are thinking about considering the covariates into the observation model. And the last thing is something I'm currently working on as well is the ties between partial orders. It's not some, uh, it's, it doesn't apply in this setting, but for example, if we have two actors have exactly the same relation with all other actors in the set of that, uh, set, then it would be better to tie these actors together as one entity. We are thinking about achieving this by, uh, uh, by applying digital process on the rows of their matrix. Basically, we classify the actors into several different groups and then assign the same features for the actors in the same group to, to generate ties in the partial orders. And also the time, like uh, mm -hmm. during the time, the ranking of bishops might change, yeah. right? Like somebody might use that it's important. Yeah, actually someone has already done that, but having a, yeah, that would be definitely another research direction as well. Someone has already done it without the error component. Yeah, but it's, yeah, I would definitely like to look into a temporary component as well. That's pretty much of my talk today. Any questions? Thanks for coming today.